FarmEd is the Centre for Farm and Food Education based here in the Cotswolds. Our mission is to promote regenerative agriculture and sustainable food systems through knowledge exchange, education, events, research and personal development. Our audience is broad, it is you, it is everyone, from children to families to farmers, local communities, chefs, policy makers, agronomists, influencers. We want to see you all here at FarmEd. So, hope you enjoy the podcast. Find us on social media, take a look at our website and come and join us soon at Farm Ed. Welcome to Farm Ed podcast number 11. I'm John T. Brunyi, Head of Sustainable Farming here at Farm Ed, the Centre for Farm and Food Education in the Cotswolds. Today I am joined by another special guest and it's an absolute pleasure because the aim of the Farm Ed podcast is to hear different voices and on this occasion a young voice, a young voice of someone who really wants to make a difference early stages of her career um, at university, but doing some great work already. So I'm delighted to be joined by Danielle Semple. Hello, Danielle. Hi, thank you for having me. It's very exciting to Great talk to about see you, great worms. to see you. <laughs> Danielle, please tell me about your journey. How did you get interested in sustainability and regenerative agriculture? Just very briefly, what, what was the light bulb moment for you? Um, so I'd say it probably started at school. Um, I've always been interested in the environment. I was eco-prefect at Eco-prefect? I've not heard of that before. <laughs> no, it was quite niche. Uh, there wasn't much competition for the role, but it was still great to do it. Um, and um, doing geography at school, I wasn't that keen on it until I got into my um, sixth form years where I got more into the actual physical side of things and learning about climate change and how, in my opinion, it's the most important thing that anyone can study because you know we have the chance to make a difference and it's we're at a tipping point that's so crucial to make any change that we can um, and it was actually in my extended essay for my international baccalaureate that I investigated the difference between organic farming and conventional farming and I was baffled by the difference between the two processes and the impact that they have so yeah I think researching more into it really expanded my brain and made me want to question more things and go into it in more depth. Um, and it was a really great opportunity to research more because I did it in the Oxfordshire area, which is where I live. Okay. So seeing it on a local area and the effects that it have made me think, gosh, what's what's happening on a global scheme mm. you know, in Brazil or um, in Asia where you yeah. know, that's the majority of food production. So the, one of the light bulb moments for you is realising that food and farming, there's lots of problems there, but also lots of solutions and opportunities too. Yeah, I think one special thing about food and farming is the fact that both parties, the consumers and producers, can make a positive difference. Um, if you compare it to uh, fossil fuels and oil production, that's very much driven by the oil industry. Whereas with food and farming, it's on every single scale possible. You know, you feed yourself three times minimum a day and that's three chances to make a positive impact yeah, on the yeah. planet. So I think it's something that everyone can do and you have to do it because yeah. you have to eat to survive. So yeah. I think it's quite pertinent for everyone. Cool. So that led you to an interest in geography and climate and environment and you, you chose geography as a degree at Exeter, where you are now. Mm -hmm. um, how are you finding the degree? How is geography as a subject? Uh, well, I've been there now four years. I'm in my final year now. Um, and it's been really great. I think in first year it's all quite exciting because you have to do physical and um, human modules at the same time. And I think having that option made me really <laughs> realise that I'm so much more interested in the physical side of things okay. and the science behind it, you know, report writing. Um, so along my four years I've slowly narrowed my niche um, down to physical and super interested in soil mm -hmm. and obviously food production. Um, and it's been great, you know, meeting new friends. I spent a week in ex um, I spent a week in Brazil doing um, ecosystem research, um, and yeah, that was. It's just been a great experience. Great. So that leads me to something very close to my heart and my feet, which is soil and earthworms. And you're you're doing your dissertation on earthworms right now. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Um, that's my newfound passion. Cool. And what, what's your title of your dissertation? Um, so the title is, how does the abundance of earthworms affect the quality of soil and um, tomato yield? Mm -hmm. But I'm comparing the presence of compost and without compost. Okay. So that's kind of an overlying factor in the farming industry. Yeah. You know? 
compost versus fertiliser or non-compost. Okay, so you've learnt lots about worms. <laughs> so Indeed. for beginners, starting at the start, um, lots of different earthworms, many, many, many different types of mm -hmm. worm. How do we start to categorise them or how, do, how can we identify our basic worms for beginners? Yeah, <laughs> so there are three different types of earthworms. Um, they operate three different areas of the soil. So the first one is um, epigeic, which operates the top um, litter layer, which will be, you know, they're, they're the smallest actually. So they're found in the leaves and the very, very top layer. So they'll be the most visible ones. Um, and they kind of just move within the, so the leaf layer. Um, and then the next ones are endogeic, which kind of go 20 centimetres down, um, but they kind of have different burrows throughout the soil profile. Um, but they incorporate more of the topsoil, which is obviously some of the most fertile soil that there is for farming. So it's, they're probably one of the most crucial ones. Um, and the last ones are the anisic, which are the largest earthworms, but they only inhabit one burrow and it goes straight down. And they're kind of the nocturnal ones, so they only come up at night um, and they operate in the deep soil, but then they're equally important bringing the organic matter from the very, very top all the way down to the bottom. They're the ones dragging it down from the top. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they all have different roles, but equally they all impact one another. Um, they all do look quite different and there are in fact quite a few good uh, worm identification sheets out there that are great for identifying them, although they are quite hard if, you know, they're different lifestyle stages. Okay. Um, but yeah. So where could I start? You know, I speak as a farmer now, where could I go to for good ID sheets? Or mm. what, what are the easy ones start identifying and getting into worms? So I think you'll find on the Soil Association um, website, they actually just this week have released this worm identification um, PDF. And it's really encouraged actually for children to participate because they give four really great ways to get um, the worms to come to the surface of the soil. How do you do um, that? So <laughs> they're all quite different. You might look a bit weird if you do it in public. <laughs> um, but the first one, which is my favourite, which actually in Exeter you see quite often because there are lots of seagulls around, mm -hmm. um, you'll see them doing a dance where yeah. they, they pat their feet on the ground. Yeah. Um, basically what the seagulls are trying to do is imitate rain, okay. the vibrations of the um, water droplets hitting the surface to mm -hmm. encourage worms to come to the top. Um, so if you <laughs> make a human do that, they just have to stamp on the, the surface of the ground, mm -hmm. do a little dance called the worm dance. Right, good, yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, that should just encourage worms to come to the top. Mm -hmm. um, another method is you practically drown them, but obviously they, don't, they won't drown, but you just you fill their burrows with water to encourage them to come to the top of the surface. Um, so you wait half an hour after you um, drown the burrows so they come to the surface and you can count them. Um, then there's, there's one term called twanging. <laughs> <laughs> I might have done that once by mistake. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you get a large um, pitchfork and then you kind of move it back and forth in the soil. Yeah. And that should just encourage a disturbance and the, so and the earthworms come to the surface. Um, and I think, oh yeah, there's only three. That's fine. Not four. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Identifying earthworms, is there any good websites or ID sheets we could turn to? Where would you look for good ID information? Um, I mean, I've kind of looked quite a lot into the scientific literature, but obviously that's not accessible for everyone. So I would really recommend, firstly, the Soil Association um, website. Also just typing into Google, um, there's a nice diagram of earthworms and the different sizes, and actually, um, like an a cross-section of the soil in which all areas they habitate. Um, so that's quite good. There's also been great research done by Jackie Stroud. She's um, one of the leading scientists in U the UK um, investigating soil science and earthworms. So she's got a great um, bit of research about earthworm populations in the UK yeah. and in farmland. Sounds good, okay. Um, what is there, I mean, is there a relationship between earthworm numbers and species variety and soil health? Have you looked into that at all? Yes, so that was kind of one of the main points of my dissertation. I wanted to firstly justify why this research is important and then um, quantify it um, in the later stages of my research. But so in organic farming, there is a straight linear relationship. Um, so as the amount of carbon and orga organic matter increases, in the soil, so does the earthworm abundance and 
their biomass and overall health, which is obviously great for all aspects of soil and plant growth. But then that relationship is completely non-existent in conventional farming. So no matter how much you do to the soil, be it fertiliser or all of these pesticides, you won't actually be getting anything from the earthworms there. Services are practically non-existent because you know you have other practices such as tillage which disturbs all their their homes and all the progress they're making practically. Um, so that kind of proves how organic farming or integrated farming is more sustainable and important for soil health and also earthworm health. So I'm trying to think around this one a little bit. So a regenerative farming system, so a minimum zero tillage system with diverse cover crops, uh, grass lays in rotations, etc., providing that organic matter less tillage should automatically have more earthworms. Is that the correlation? Yes. Or is it the organic nature of no sprays, no nitrogen fertiliser, or is it both? I think it's probably hard to categorise them into two separate entities. Um, obviously, there is a set um, practice or method for earthworms that advantages them in their services that they provide. Um, I would say that the ones that probably benefit them more is the reduced tillage or no tillage okay. because that's obviously a physical disturbance. Mm. Um, and actually, anisic earthworms, the ones that burrow into the deep soil, those are probably the most advantaged because they're protected. You know, the plough might not necessarily go as deep as their burrows, mm -hmm. but that still leaves the other two species practically, um, you know, damaged and their burrows that they've made all gone. Yeah. Um, so it still impacts, you know, two thirds of the species, which is a huge amount. Mm. Um, so, but then again, having the cover, cover crops and not using pesticides is obviously great because it means that the, the whole food chain is re-established and mm. it's not affected as much. So thinking about the food chain, just one more step up. So obviously the worms are good for the soil and there's that relationship there. What else eats worms? Thinking about higher up in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so as I mentioned earlier, seagulls. Seagulls. <laughs> <laughs> They're not the only um, type of bird. So you get blackbirds, all of the different types of birds eat them. And it's actually a really important source of protein for them because mm. obviously um, earthworms are a bit bigger than bugs. So they're more um, beneficial to their diet. And obviously, you know, then the birds get eaten by foxes or all of that stuff. So they kind of all link. Yeah. Um, and also the earthworms feed on bacteria, okay. which and they provide more bacteria as a result. Right. So it's kind of like a positive um, effect. Yeah, cool. So a crucial part of the ecosystem. Out of interest, do you know how many species of earthworm there are in the world or in the UK? Um, <laughs> I don't know the world, yeah. but in the UK, there are actually 26 different species. Right. So, you know, a fair, a fair amount for yeah. the, <laughs> the amount of soil. And some very rare, some more common, or are they all...? Um, I think the, um, in the research, the common earthworm is the one that is the endogeic, so... Mm, the one it, we all see, the big fat one. Yes, yeah, like yeah. quite red in yeah, colour as yeah. well. Um, so that's kind of called the common earthworm. Mm -hmm. Cool, mm -hmm. thank you very much. And then just drilling down into your dissertation a little bit, so you were looking at compost and tomatoes. Tell me more about your findings so far. Yeah, so um, it's a bit annoying because my main, my results, what they showed was that I did not use enough compost right. <laughs> to start with. And although the effect there was an effect that was seen. It was actually not significant in my research, um, but it's quite a po it's a positive outcome really because it shows that although there was a slight increase in all the variables with the presence of compost, um, if I added more compost, obviously that result would be further increased. So it shows that it does justify the importance of using compost in farming. Um, so good compost, good humus into a system. Mm -hmm. More worms, more active worms. Is that what you're starting to show? Or is it related to yield? How were you linking it to the tomatoes? Um, so kind of what I was measuring was yield was the main aspect of plant growth, but then I was also measuring the soil health. So I kind of categorised them as physical and then like chemical processes. So what was also was quite surprising for my results was that um, without earthworms and without the presence of compost, the yield was the highest which was a bit annoying. <laughs> Very, that's interesting. Do we know why? <laughs> what um, have you shown here? <laughs> I tried to find any other explanations in my research, but, but I think that it might be the fact that earthworms actually can have a greater effect in low quality soil. So without compost, obviously the soil is a lower quality. Um, 
but then all the other factors in the soil weren't as good in without earthworms. It's quite confusing. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, you might have to run that by me again. I'm really confused now. <laughs> um, so the best yields were from tomatoes in what? Without compost. Without compost. And, and their without roots, earthworms. Their roots were in what? A, a um, growing medium. So I had like a 30 litre pot um, and I sourced some topsoil from a company locally and, and then I added compost from like a generic compost organic bag. Mm. Um, so then the com I mixed them in a combination and a ratio of three to one, okay. but that ratio wasn't enough, obviously. Yeah. Um, so the soil did best, the plain old top soil yeah, without yeah. added compost, I see. So maybe that is the promising thing there, so that actually a good top soil can do mm -hmm. the job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But then what I kind of have deduced from that finding of the yield was that despite all the soil variables indicating that the higher the number of earthworms, in the presence of compost actually benefited all the soil variables. Okay. Um, my research just wasn't long enough for that effect to actually carry through to the yield yeah. because obviously that was only one harvesting period. Um, but if it's not really representative, representative yeah. of a natural system because obviously you carry through, have a five year rotation mm. um, and uh, yeah, so... Yeah, more to do, yeah, mm -hmm, more indeed. to look into. Brill. <laughs> so that leads me to think, you know, what, what's next in your journey? Where do you want to end up? Um, so ideally, I'd really like to carry on my research in earthworms and soil science and seeing how actually we can um, improve their effect in soil and carry it through onto like a wide scale in the UK. Um, because they are, they, they make up two thirds of the soil biomass um, so they're a huge huge part of the soil and it seems silly that we've only just started to realize how we can actually use them to measure the quality of soil um, and I think it's quite prominent in the UK that we need to make a change now because the amount of funding that goes towards soil compared to other factors is minimal it's a bit embarrassing um, and obviously earthworms are a free measurement tool that we can use yeah. so I'd be quite keen um, spreading the awareness obviously doing this podcast is great you know talking to you and asking questions and providing insight is you know one of the first steps to help more farmers realize their potential brilliant danielle thank you it's been wonderful having you here talking about soil and earthworms and hearing more about your early stage career and your research and your work at uni long may it continue um, i'm john t i'm the head of farming here at farmed um, do come and see us we'll have lots of events um, on our events calendar, including some events on soil health and worm identification. So maybe, Danielle, you can come and help us with that in the <laughs> summer when I'd you're back. To. Real. <laughs> Danielle, thank you very much. Thank you. The production of this podcast was funded by the Farming the Future Coronavirus Emergency Response Fund. Thank you to the A-Team, Roddick, Samworth and 30 Percy Foundations for your support. <laughs>